we are going to discuss about a new topic. So, how many of you feel that uh, we are uh, uh, not good at intubation? So we couldn't able to intubate. And uh, sometimes when we try intubation, uh, child uh, went into cardiac arrest. So like that, any of you people face this situation in your uh, practice? So one thing is I couldn't able to intubate, but when I am trying to intubate, uh, I pass on the tube very nicely, but post intubation, child was arrested. So how many of you uh, people face this situation? Can anyone share their experience? Tema, are you? What's the name? What's the No one tried intubation. All are perfect. 100% uh, perfect intubations. No problem, especially during intubation. Are you people who don't want to reveal uh, the. Uh, Imperfect integrations. PGs can can talk. It's not an uh, uh, court so that we can hide the because other has to join. That's why just we'll prolong the discussion. We we'll give four or five more minutes time for them to join and we'll start the uh, case discussion. Before that, uh, just for interaction, anyone want to share their experience? No? Okay, I think all are uh, uh, having perfect intubation, so I think you don't need to clear this class. But anyway, for people who not started intubation, it will be a learning lesson for them. Uh, so we'll move on to today's uh, case based discussion. This is will be delivered by Dr. Balakrishna Pallanti. Uh, he is our consultant pediatrician and the cardiac intensivist. Uh, he did the MBBS from JJ Medical College and uh, MD Pediatrics from Narana Medical College and PhD Fellowship from Apollo Children's Hospital Chennai. And after that, he worked as a senior fellow in uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital Bangalore. Uh, then after that, uh, he worked uh, in Bangalore and he returned uh, to Vijayawada and he is currently working with us for the last one half year uh, as a pediatric intensivist and cardiac intensivist. Uh, his area interest was pediatric ventilation, shock, postal cardiac management, difficult airway management, and cardiopulmonary interactions. And he had publications in IAP and IJBP as well. And he has a faculty, he participated in various CMEs and the conferences. And I hope he will take you through the journey of uh, a difficult intubation today. And I hope it should be an interactive session and we'll continue this interactive session. And we need answers from all of you people. Don't be silent. 
and if you don't want to share your experience at least uh, you can share your answers with that and to bala krishna bala krishna get that in good evening everyone so our topic of discussion will be regarding intubations and what is exactly going to happen so i have faced it uh, during my pg times like whenever i intubated someone like i got everything was fine and i used to feel myself i am very good at intubation so i have intubated like this and i have uh, faced scenarios where child went into cardiac arrest where tube was fine everything was fine so can we prevent it and uh, what are the different uh, experiences which we had so i list uh, have a discussion so i have taken uh, three case scenarios so we'll discuss briefly on how to manage how to prevent the complications and what actions can be taken so first case scenario a 2 years old male child was brought to a hospital with complaints of increased work of breathing since 5 days not accepting feeds well since 2 days and uh, altered sensorium since yesterday evening so on arrival to our hospital on initial uh, pediatric assessment triangle appearance wise is irritable peripheries were cold uh, child had increased work of breathing so what is your interpretation initially with these findings and uh, what do you intervene here anyone so this is an unstable life threatening condition right because peripheries were cold there is increased work of breathing and appearance was child was irritable so we initially start on oxygen with 5 liters and we have asked for iv access and we move to the primary assessment so primary assessment uh, airway is maintained breathing wise child respiratory rate is 50 per minute definitely is tachycardic and there are signs of uh, nasal flaring child is moaning on auscultation bilateral airway is there vis is present saturation 82% on room air and we uh, sats are 88% even with o2 circulation wise uh, heart rate is 180 per minute pulse is low volume crt prolonged and uh, child bp is 86 by 50 so gcs uh, it is 12 by 15 so on exposure he is febrile so what is your uh, primary assessment so anyone so uh, sir gcs is low and child is febrile so there could be an possibility of cns infection and child is in compensated shock and there is uh, respiratory distress like uh, impending respiratory failure sir no no respiratory distress is there sir yeah there is uh, definitely can be febrile encephalopathy and child is having uh, respiratory distress is having uh, even signs of failure there is nasal flaring moaning is there even with oto also is just getting saturation of 88 right so circulation wise so as you mentioned uh, heart rate is very high it can be with fever and it can be because of pulse shock also and the crt is prolonged so what you are going to do next so child is definitely respiratory failure because there is moaning and there are signs of respiratory failure such as nasal flaring significant tachypnea so and there is a decompensated shock second is cerebral dysfunction because the pulse the shock and hypoxia had uh, altered cerebral functions so what you are going to intervene here so initially you will ask the get the so we will do a vvg we will do grbs we will uh, ask them to give fluid bolus start oxygen via face mask and we need to prepare for intubation so further course in er vvg is 7.15 pco to 50 pao to 40 bicarb 16 base deficit minus 9 lactate 3.5 so 
GRBS is uh, 45 mg per deciliter, so we are giving uh, 10 percent extra 2 ml per kg. So, as such, we know all the child was in shock, so we have given uh, 5 ml per kg in your suspected cardiogenic shock, but uh, vitals were same. But in you of persistent stock still, so we have given another fluid bolus, child has this time worsened. So it's a common scenario which we even we face during our PJ days where child comes in shock. So we see the child is in uh, shock, distress. So we try to give fluid bolus. Then uh, definitely sometimes the child distress further worsens, shock will worsen. So here I have decided to go ahead with the intubation. So I have tried to give metazolam and succinyl choline. So I tried to intubate this child, and child went into cardiac arrest. So why do we think? So four things here. So what could be the reason for worsening after second fluid bolus? Anyone? Uh -huh. The child uh, who came with uh, ER with distress, shock, compensated shock, respiratory failure. So we tried one bolus. There was not response. So we thought we'll give another bolus. But this time there was worsening. Why? Uh, any pulmonary edema, sir, or uh, cardiac failure child, like giving bolus that is worsening the condition? Yeah, that's a very good answer. So it can be because we already mentioned we are suspecting cardiogenic shock here. Because in the clinical uh, history, with the uh, symptoms and uh, vitals and all in the clinical examination, we thought it could be cardiogenic shock. So definitely, yeah, after second fluid bolus, pulmonary edema got worsened. So Definitely the fluid bolus is not a good thing to do, second thing. I agree. Any other reasons? Cardiogenic shock, sir. Okay. So, if you don't want to mention here, you can leave it in the chat box also. So, what are your thoughts? So, what is the reason for cardiac arrest in this chain? What we did, everything was correct only, right? So, child was in hypoxia, child was in hypotension. So, we decided to intubate this child, which is a correct thing only because if we wait for some more time, the child will land in cardiac arrest. So, before that only we intubated. So, we are given midazolam and succinyl choline. We are given a sedation and analgesic drug, and we are given paralytic agent also. So, what was the reason you think for cardiac arrest in this child? Uh, sir, uh, like we had given uh, midazolam, okay. so if uh, that can go sometimes like hypotension, so without uh, correcting the circulation, uh, we intubated the child, so that might be a possibility, sir. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, that is one of the reasons because we did not correct hypotension and we directly went into intubation. Any other reason? Any futures of raised ICP when midazolam given, sir? No, because uh, midazolam actually will it is a so it's not going to cause raised ICP. Or any manipulation, but there is no futures of ICP, sir. Yeah. So one answer is correct. The child is in uh, hypotension was not correct, and we decided to intubate this child. So definitely that can be the cause. So any other cause? S-dosis. Yeah, testosis is one cause. So, as I told, Bicar was, I think, 15 to 16. So, definitely we did not correct testosis. That can be one of the reasons for cardiac arrest. Any other cause? Hypoxia, sir. Yeah, hypoxia, hypotension, metabolic estrosis, all multifactorial are there in this particular child for reason for the cardiac arrest. So, we need to correct all of these measures before we try to intubate this child. So, what measures can be taken here to prevent the cardiac arrest in this particular child? So, we all know it is a, we are treating a cardiogenic shock. So, we all know we have a child has worsened after second fluid bolus. So, we decided to intubate because we, we thought we are got, we got scared. 
sats are dropping bb is dropping so we decided to intervene so he went into cardiac arrest. so what measures can be taken to prevent cardiac arrest so one of you has mentioned midazolam so do you want to give any other drug fentanyl sir fentanyl is a good drug but uh, actually fentanyl is just an uh, analgesic more of a analgesic it is less of a sedative because whenever you try to intubate someone uh, analgesic is not on sufficient you need to sedate and analgesic are both so other than fentanyl hmm? because basically when you are suspecting uh, sorry sir manoj sir okay. any other drug inotropes can be given sir yeah uh, that's a very good answer so we can start inotropes vitamin bicarbonate correction sir okay uh, starting inotropes so starting inotropes uh, correction of acidosis bicarbonate can be given so any other measures to be taken further pre oxygenation okay pre oxygenation has to be done because usually for this child it may pre oxygenate no because we got scared because after fluid bolus the hypotension was in hypoxia further was in so we thought okay no 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 we should intubate so we did not correct any one of these and uh, this thing so we tried to intubate so i have got answers in the chat box few of them i have replied as ketamine yeah ketamine is a one nice drug of choice when you want to intubate so just main thing which i want to stress out here is whenever you are trying to intubate a cardiogenic shock child main thing is your already the catecholamines would be drained so there is a deficit of catecholamines and other thing is uh, you want the heart function to slow down so if the child is awake child is restless and irritable that can also further worsen his shock so you want the child to be calm sedated so less workload on the heart right so whenever you are intubating someone basically for respiration you want the lungs to take rest so decrease workload on lung so if you want to intubate for heart cause you want to decrease workload on the heart so these are the things right so whenever you want to intubate someone for these particular reasons so what drugs are the best choice for intubating this child so one everyone told ketamine along with ketamine any other drug to be given muscle relaxant okay muscle relaxant which drug you want to choose because uh, i have chosen succinyl choline the child went into cardiac arrest so any other drug pancuronium can be also be given sir sorry i didn't i can't hear sorry pancuronium or vecronium okay good drug okay so what is the difference between uh, Succinyl colon and vecronium. Anyone? Uh, succinyl colon is long acting. Vecronium is short acting. acting. Or vecronium is short acting. Which is long acting? Which is short acting? Succinyl colon is long acting. Vecronium is short acting, sir. Sure. Um. Okay. So. why actually this child was in why actually this child went into cardiac arrest so what will happen is usually the functional residual capacity will be very very low because of already pulmonary edema and everything is there above that whenever you give the sedation your frc is further low so the hypoxia cannot be tolerated at all so once you give any sedative drugs your airway protective reflexes are gone so that will further worsen in the hypoxia and it can lead to cardiac arrest so if you don't correct this it can cause cardiac arrest so hypotension whatever drugs you choose so some of them stole fenta ketamine whatever so they will further vasodilate so and cause a peripheral pooling of blood and preload is significantly reduced right? so because the blood is already pooled in the periphery so systemic circulatory blood is reduced and catecholamines are completely drained so these are all multiple causes which actually can uh, cause a child arrest so how you manage hypoxia so you use uh, non invasive postoperative ventilation or non breathing mask or vein circuit which you are comfortable with 
So main thing is usually we have the habit of using uh, bag and mask ventilation, but we don't use the peep. So there is a button above that. So if you press that, it will provide the peep. So recently I've asked many PGs, so they will tell sir, we usually do it when there is no chest trace. So what will happen is you are giving peep with that, which will actually improve your map, mean airway pressure. With that, the, it will open the closed audio. That will provide the nice oxygenation and it will give the chest trace. And main important thing which we tend to forget is whenever intubating someone, we'll do oxygen till then and we'll remove the oxygen after that. So we will usually try to intubate at saturations of 96 to 98%. So for 96 to 98%, usually if person is very good at intubation, one can intubate in maximum 15 to 20 seconds. So till that time, the saturation usually will drop till 90 to 90 for 96. So sometimes it can take more than 30 seconds. Sometimes it can take 45 seconds to intubate because with manipulation, uh, cricoid pressure, many things. So at that time, the SATs can drop to even 88, 84. So once it's dropped less than 88, the curve will drop. Within no time, the saturation will drop to 70 and there will be bad effects. So how you prevent that? Administration of nasal oxygen during this brief apneic period to intubation will actually prevent the hypoxia. So hypotension management, uh, Fluid loading prior to intubation will actually prevent the development of hypotension by optimizing the cardiac preload. So how you assess that? You can use a bedside technique, any passive leg raise test. As many of you answered, uh, best thing you need to use vasa activations because it will helpful in the hypotension which is caused by drugs due to intubation. So initial drug will be norepinephrine, but usually we'll start adrenaline when we suspect cardiogenic shock prior to intubation. So what are the drugs used? So best drug you usually is ketamine because uh, dose is 1 to 2 mg per kg. The advantage is sir, it is a potent analgesic and uh, useful in automatic uh, brain injury cases also. And remember ketamine does not cause rise recently. It is very cardio stable drug. So you can use in any asthma cases on a respiratory knees or anything, or you can use in traumatic brain injury. You can use in cardio cases because it is a cardio stable drug. The main disadvantage is sir, it can cause hypertension and tachycardia. <laughs> and it sometimes can cause increased secretions. So with metazolam, it is actually a better amnesia and sedation drug, but sometimes it may cause hypotension. And Fenta, it is very fast acting. It is also relatively cardio stable. The main problem which we usually face is sometimes if we give fentanyl, it will cause a chest wall rigidity. So sometimes you can't bag. So let's go to the Second case scenario, it's a seven years old child who has presented to ER with uh, vomitings for two days, hurried breathing for one day. Past history, there is increase in maturations in seven days and increase in thirst in seven days. So it arrived to hospital, initial uh, assessment, appearance was drowsy, irritable, peripheries were cold, breathing, there is increased work of breathing. So what is your interpretation? So child presented with increased work of breathing, decrease in sensorium, and uh, increase in micturition and increase in thirst in seven days. Anyone? Is it stable or unstable, child? Unstable, sir. Yeah, it's unstable, child. Is it life-threatening? It is life-threatening. Child is in shock. Yeah, so peripheries are cold. There is increased work of breathing. GCS is not good. So definitely it is a life-threatening, unstable, unstable life-threatening condition, right? So what are you going to do? Uh, secure an IV line, uh, give IV fluid bolus, check the CBG, and uh, increase work of breathing, oxygen can be delivered. Good. So go to the primary assessment. So airway is maintained. Breathing-wise, uh, respiratory rate of 50 per minute. Bilateral air entry is normal, no added sounds. Saturation 98% at room air, 99% even with oxygenation. Circulation wise, heart rate is 140. Low volume pulses, CRT is prolonged. BP is 96 by 60. Uh -huh. Disability GCS is around 9 by 15. So GRBS is 560 milligram per deciliter. So what do you think? What do you think the diagnosis is here? 
diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. Any other causes? Um, any crisis, sir? Like a... Okay. Uh, your thought process is good. Can be. So, main, key, main conditions, what are there here? On your second, on your primary assessment. So, child is in? Uh, there is no any respiratory cause, only uh, tachypnea is there, sir. Okay. So, it could be like acidotic breathing or something. Okay. And saturation on room air, bilateral equal air entry. Okay. So, child is in respiratory distress, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so and there is metabolic acidosis. Okay. So why do you think GCS is poor here? Uh, polyuria is there, diuresis is there. So shock nala, the child could be. Yeah, so definitely there is shock, definitely that can worsen your uh decrease cerebral blood flow that can cause huge poor GCS, right? So child is in severe respiratory distress, child is in compensated shock. So it can be DKA. So we do VBG, do GRBS, urine ketones, fluid bolus. Then uh, we'll start oxygen via face mask. So blood pressure is definitely on the lower side, but still child is in the compensated shock. So we did a VBG, pH of 6.9, PCO to 18, PO to 45, bicarb of 5. Base steps at uh, minus 18, bracket of 2.5, which is showing metabolic acidosis with compensated CO2 washout. So, what are the problems anticipated here? Prairie intubation. Anyone? Because we decided to intubate this child. So what do you think the problems can occur? This time now we are clear because in the first case we have uh, burnt our hands which tried away in for intubation. So this time we are more careful and we decide okay, what are the problems which can arise before you intubate this particular chain? So what are the problems anticipated? Hypovolemia. Okay, good. So child is in shock. So we need to correct shock. Next. We need to correct ketoacidosis also at first. So, I mean, uh, in DKA, ketoacidosis definitely you need to correct, but we need to start insulin. It will take some time before your ketoacidosis is corrected because uh, you know in DKA, the metabolic acidosis is due to per se not because of uh, loss of bicarbonate, but it is due to increased ketones in the body, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, any other cause? Hyperkalemia. Will there be hyperkalemia in uh, DKA? Acidosis because of acidosis. Okay. So will acidosis cause hyperkalemia or hyperkalemia causes acidosis? No, usually I used to have this question whenever in my PG days. So, because my concern used to ask uh, whether acidosis will cause hyperkalemia or hyperkalemia will cause acidosis. Anyone? Because he has made a valid point, hyperkalemia. Definitely, it can be hyperkalemia, but uh, if you see hyperkalemia, what you're going to see in this particular child here? Because it's a common scenario which we face. This is out of discussion, but I just wanted to clarify. So, we don't do if you see hyperkalemia. Anyone? Acidosis will cause hyperkalemia, sir. Why? In order to lose its ions, so there will be retention of potassium. Yeah, so usually with metabolic acidosis will have hyperkalemia because so what will happen in metabolic acidosis, your H plus is high, so to throw that, they will retain the potassium. I agree. So another common cause which we face during this particular scenario. So as I mentioned here, there is hypotension, right? Child is in hypotension. As we all know, it is DKA, straight forward. So child is definitely hypovolemic because child is having increased micturation. Definitely child wouldn't have taken much fluids orally. So sometimes even in hypovolemic patients, usually we'll get squeezed sample. So
So there will be no much uh, flow when you try to take the sample. So sometimes that squeezed sample also will be hyperkalemia. So if you see hyperkalemia, try to see the sample. Usually most of the times if you hypovolemia, out of 100 times, how good you are, how good the person he is putting a cannula, if you put a large bore cannula, doesn't matter. Out of 100 times, 60 times I have seen hyperkalemia. But immediately I repeated, uh, within two hours, again, the potassium is normal. Just want to clarify that. So, as we all mentioned, the problems here are one is hypotension. One of you has mentioned definitely there is metabolic acidosis. So, any other problems? Uh, um, because uh, there may be apnea, uh, the PCO2 may raise. Uh, so, that raise may cause uh, sudden, uh, like it may worsen uh, acidosis. Okay, good. So, what are the precautions uh, you will take before intubation? So, now you know all the problems, right? So, you are worried about hypoxia, you are worried about uh, hypotension, you are worried about acidosis. So, what are the problems you are going to take? So, some, one of you has mentioned even nicely regarding the rise of PCO2. I totally agree. So, why do you think PCO2 is rising? I mean, is rising when you decide to intubate someone? Because I have intubated many respiratory cases with PCO2 of 75, 80, but uh, post intubation, my PCO2s are fine. So, what are the precautions you will take before you intubate this child? Correction of shock and uh, pre oxygenation. Okay. Good. Next, anyone? So, usually you will correct the shock. You need to correct your acidosis, definitely. So, and I mentioned about the haptic oxygenation. Anyone? We can give IV fluid, sir. If there is anything like very profound acidosis, can we give a bicarbonate infusion, uh, Actually, now in this particular case of DK, actually, I just uh, want, I have taken this scenario so that people would understand. Usually, in DK, we don't give bicarb. The reason yes, only IV fluid will be giving. But yeah. if it's like severe acidosis prior to intubation, is there an indication to give us now? No, in, in such cases also, usually we try to avoid that because as you all know, the worsened GCS is because of cerebral edema. The cerebral edema is per se because of the hyponatremia, because of factors rise in the hyperglycemia. I don't want to go into deep pathophysiology, but this is the reason. So usually why we avoid giving sodium bicarbonate during DKA is, so finally your sodium bicarbonate is nothing but if you try to remember your chemistry, it is finally H2O. H plus plus HCO3 minus. Again, that is going into H2O plus CO2. Am I clear? So, you are giving sodium bicarbonate, which is again, that is the reason when you give sodium bicarbonate, why your sodium prices it is has sodium inside within it. So, what will happen to the remaining H2CO3? It will differentiate into H2O plus CO2. So, again, the CO2 will be rise. That is the reason you usually avoid uh, bicarbonate. But if this is a case where usually we see these scenarios where you see a three years old or it may be one year old or eight, nine months baby, where you see the same history, child was fine, uh, well thriving child, suddenly child has some cough, cold or fever, suddenly they will be worsening distress, suspecting IEM, then you need to give bicarbonate. Am I clear? Yes, sir. So, somebody has mentioned nicely, so PCO2 will go up. So, what is the reason? So when there is severe metabolic acidosis, uh, when there is pH of 6.9 in this particular case, PCO2 is 18. So, child is hyperventilating, definitely. And that will wash out the PCO2. But how much you try to hyperventilate also, it will only reduce this much. But uh, you have given some drugs to intubate. Some wants to give ketamine, I am fine, Fanta, you are fine, whatever. So you are given the drug. So, I told you, right, so how much you will bag? So usually I have myself, I will bag with the normal rate of 30. Irrespective of PCO2 level, sometimes even myself being a consultant also, I will bag at 30. 
and sometimes i'll see where my pgs will be bagging at 20 because i'll bag for 5 minutes so i can give to my pg so that he will bag okay so that i can take rest so he'll be bagging at 20 sometimes he'll bag at 50 sometimes he or she will bag at 20 so what will happen all this is because already your ph is low they are compensating by pco to wash out so you intubated someone during the brief apnea it will be at least 15 seconds 15 seconds brief period because you intubate you check the tube position then you connect the bag you start bagging and person changing positions so this all will cause further fall in the ph because your pco to will rise right because you have taken away all the rate with the child is breathing so what will happen next so you take the gas ph is 6.7 your pco is 38 so whatever rate you set may not match with your physiological rate so we need to bag the child at supra physiological rate so whenever you are intubating particular scenario cases so you need to give supra physiological rates so if the child is initially breathing before you intubate at 40 try to give 45 rate in that way you can maintain your pc water so that there will be not much drop in the ph so if you repeat the gas same person if you give with supra physiological effort your ph will be 7 your pc water will be 16 that is good gas right so in the meanwhile you will start insulin you will start uh, corrections fluid bolus definitely your bicarb will uh, get better at the same time your ph will get better clear on this scenario all of you understood yes sir so what are the recommendations from my side so usually in particular cases of dk usually we try to avoid the intubation and use of nav try to avoid the spontaneous expiration because sometimes you are seen kids where they breathe at 50 60 also i can't give 60 70 rate right, uh, myself so try to avoid that and use of nav and try to big spontaneous respirations avoid use of long muscle uh, long acting muscle relaxants such as uh, rocuronium or pancuronium so fluid bolus definitely you need to give i just i just mentioned here inulin in dk we don't give bicarb correction but if it is the same scenario where you suspect iem you need to give bicarb correction and at least start of inotropes not in this case but in case of iem so with that we have completed uh, two case scenarios so just briefly so you are suspecting a physiological difficult airway hypoxia give apneic oxygenation and use of bag and mask ventilation give peep so i have seen many people usually they don't give peep i have seen two three people answering to me when they tell sir i use that button only if there is no chest raise so that actually will give peep that will open your closed alveoli definitely then you will see the sats are getting picked up nicely hypotension you need to optimize your hemodynamics by giving fluid boluses so if you are suspecting cardiogenic shock i suggest myself to go slowly give 5 ml see the response then another 5 ml if the response is there give if you are suspecting hypovolemic or distributional you can go ahead with 10 ml per kg if slightly bigger child you can see the response if you do like a passive degrees test near the bed side clinically how you going to see the response with the fluids the heart rate will come down and there will be some response in the bp and early use of inotropes so metabolic acidosis how you will correct is you need to correct your acidosis by giving sodium bicarb and uh, one more point is as i already clearly mentioned in the last slide so rate we need to give definitely super physiological rate this particular child it's okay because as i mentioned here gcs is 9 by 15 so i can wait on intubating this child so sometimes your scenario where uh, your gcs is 7 so you need to intubate this child in that particular cases give supra physiological rate so that your ph won't drop and it will cause further worsening and it can lead to cardiac arrest so going into the another case discussion so is it clear to all of you regarding what we are discussing
So we'll go to the third case discussion. Uh, a five years old child who is a known case of some genetic disorder now came with increased work of breathing since three days, decreased intake of heat since one day. The child has uh, distress worsened since last evening. So he's a known case of genetic disorder, increased work of breathing, and distress worsened since last evening. So a terrible to hospital. Initial assessment triangle appearance is irritable. Peripheries were poor. There is increased work of breathing. So what is your interpretation and how do you intervention this child? Unstable, life-threatening. So it's unstable, life-threatening change. So how do you intervene? So you need to start oxygen, you need to ask for IV access and you need to move for the primary assessment. The primary assessment, airway is maintained, breathing way, child having respiratory rate of 50, child is moaning, nasal flaring is there, bilateral rate is present. Saturation wise, 82% at room air, uh, with oxygen it is 90%. Circulation wise, heart rate is 140, low volume pulses, CRT is prolonged, VP is on the lower side, 86 by 46. Disability wise, uh, GCS is poor, 8 by 15, on exposure, cold periphery is there. So what is your assessment of this trade? So what is your assessment of this trade? Respiratory distress is there, sir. Okay. And impending failure, like there is moaning is there and saturation like 90% with oxygen. And second is like uh, tachycardia and uh, shock is there. And uh, cold peripheries, uh, we can think uh, CBG value, so we can check the CBG for this. Yeah, CBG value, we have checked uh, CBG is normal. Sorry, capillary blood gas, you meant. Okay. So, capillary blood gas, we have done. Uh, so, capillary blood gas is showing uh, pH of uh, 7.2, PCO2 of 38, sorry, PCO2 of 50, PO2 of 45. You can just tell the assessment. So, you are correct in the assessment part. So, JLD is on severe respiratory disease on the verge of respiratory failure. There is decomposed shock. As I have mentioned here, uh, JLD is a known case of some denting disorder, which we don't know. So, definitely there is primary cerebral dysfunction. So, you do the capillary blood gas or VBG, fluid bolus, oxygenation via face mask. So, this particular child, we have secured IV access, given fluid bolus of 10 ml per kg, continued on O2 via face mask. And so, we decided to intubate this particular child. So, we have given Medaz and Vectronium. We started bag and mask ventilation, but couldn't be able to get the chest rise. So, how many of you faced any scenario where you're intubating someone where you did bag and mask? So, you are used to peep also, but still you couldn't get the chest rise. Uh, seal won't be proper, sir. That's a very good answer. Uh, any, any other answers? Sometimes the oxygen, they won't turn on, sir. Sometimes it happens. Yeah, so you need to check whether you are if you're using NRM, so if you need to be filled or not. And uh, chest rise, why you could not get chest rise? Uh, proper head, uh, like head tilt and uh, shoulder rolls. Uh, like. Yeah, okay. Next. I faced it. One thing which you told very nicely was uh, proper mask seal. So, which usually we don't do. We straight away put the mask and we think that we can back. So, any other causes, anyone? Position of the tube, ET tube. No, it is only bag and mask still. We did not oh. eat it. Oh. Okay. We decided to intubate, so given we started bag and mask, but couldn't get chest rise still. Tongue fall back or airway closure. Okay, any airway obstruction. Okay. Anyone wants to contribute further? Neck flexion. Uh, neck flexion, shoulder roll. Yeah. One of them has mentioned it as dope. So dope usually we do it uh, when we post intubate when we don't see the chest strains. So dope is nothing but displacement, obstruction, pneumothorax, equipment failure as we all know. But usually we do it when we intubate and we don't see the chest strains. Three to tube inside. So one of them has answered uh, nicely. 
So you need to see Yamma Sopa. So Yamma Sopa, as I already mentioned, you need to adjust the mask properly, reposition the head to open the airway. Suction thinking also very, very important and open mouth and lift the jaw forward because sometimes there will be tongue fall back and you need to increase the pressure also. As I mentioned, sometimes your pressure it may not be also sufficient when you can't uh, see the chest rise and arrange for artificial airway. So what do you do when you see a difficult mask ventilation? So you start administering 100% oxygen. As I have told you, you need to check for the equipment. So equipment malfunction is there. You need to switch to self inflating bag. If there is no malfunction of the equipment, you need to check the patient. As I have told, do MR SOPA here. Adjusting the tricord pressure, 2% bag and mal mask, shoulder roll. So still it is unresolved. Then you immediately need to call for help. And you need to reassess the chain. So as I have told you, everyone told about MR SOPA. Where it adjusts, position, suctioning, everything we did. But still, the issue is not resolved. So, definitely, you need to call for help. So, you need to assess the child again. So, I have faced this scenario one to two times. So, you need to rule out any upper airway obstruction. If that is the case, you need to place any supraglottic airway or world airway. If there is no upper airway obstruction, sometimes we have faced this scenario where there is a laryngospasm or bronchospasm. So sometimes uh, you have might, might be sedated and uh, given analgesic, but sometimes you don't give sufficient uh, paralysis. So if you don't give sufficient muscle relaxant, also you will feel the laryngospasm. So you won't see the chest rise. So you need to increase the sedation dose, and you need to increase the, and give a muscle relaxant also, and continue CPAP. Sometimes fentanyl also will cause this bronchosedative uh, chest wall rigidity. So be careful when you are need everything, you are ruled out upper airway obstruction, you are given nice sedation. But sometimes what will happen with Fenta, it can cause chest wall rigidity where you can't uh, do bag and mask ventilation properly. So you did MR SOPA. So now after adjusting the mask properly and doing proper suctioning of the oral cavity, now able to do bag and mask, you are getting nice chest rise. Now you decide, okay, fine, everything is good. So you decide to intubate this child. So, but now you fail in the intubation. So what to do next? So what you will do if you fail in the intubation now? Either change the technique or change the hand. Okay, sir. Next, anyone? Uh, we can see the size of the tube. And... Uh... After visualizing proper uh, opal cord, we should play. Sometimes it could be an esophageal intubation. Okay. Good. So sometimes, usually, whenever you fail in intubation, the first thing the person who is intubating thinks that he can't intubate, he or she. That is actually not correct. You need to see the technique. The technique should be correct. So... After technique, then you need to select a proper uh, laryngoscope blade. Sometimes if you select a one size blade for an infant, sometimes you are crossing the vocal cords and you will be seeing esophagus and you couldn't visualize the vocal cords. Sometimes you select a double zero blade for an infant, again it will be a problem. So you can't uh, lift properly and you can't visualize the vocal cords properly, right? So any other causes and another thing which we need to remember here is uh, proper size of DT tube. Sometimes if you select the wrong size, wrong blade and wrong technique, these three things need to be looked for. So you need to tell to the other person why I have failed in this particular technique, why I couldn't intubate. So these things ruled out, then what else you need to think? Difficult airway. Okay, what do you mean exactly by difficult airway? Uh, any uh, prior edema over the cords? Like, uh, okay, so it can be misshaped sometimes, uh, anti-replacement vocal cords. 
uh, improper sedation like the child doesn't go to complete paralysis that could be yeah we have ruled out right so we did the uh, mr sopa so i told him so we have ruled out uh, that also so no, we sedated nicely we went paralysis and say everything is proper so we are able to get chest rise also but we failed in the intubation part laryngospasm yeah we have ruled that also right so i was telling you previous slide so difficult mask ventilation is this so laryngospasm you can't get chest rise also So failed endotracheal intubation. Again, you need to, as I was telling you, repeat laryngoscopy. Avoid repeated attempts. So check your position. External airway manipulation is important. As I, two or three of you have mentioned, different blade or different handle needs to be checked. Still, if that is poor view is there, if you follow all the things, then you need to intubating using supraglottic airway. Or if you try, can use uh, indirect video laryngoscopy if you are available, or fiber optic bronchoscopy. If it is difficult, then take the supraglottic airway. If the patient is stable, awaken the patient. You muscle pair. If you are paralyzed in the chain, you reverse it. So patient will definitely get away from the center. So you remove that. So if there is unstable hemodynamics or still hypoxia is there, you need to switch to. Cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. So unanticipated, cannot intubate, cannot ventilate child. So you need to call for help. So you need to see whether patient is stable or unstable. If patient is stable, SATs are maintaining no bradycardia, no cardiac arrest. Awaken the patient. So you need to give sugar medics, which is reversal. Then you can awaken the patient. The patient is unstable with bradycardia, impending cardiac arrest, hemodynamic instability. You need to call for the EMT help. Immediately call for help when you cannot intubate or cannot ventilate someone. So if surgery is available, try for surgical airway tracheostomy. If surgery is not available, then you can try for needle tracheostomy. So when we will answer, anticipate the anatomical difficult airway. This which you placed was unanticipated, right? Because we thought everything was fine, so we decided to intubate this particular. Okay. No other service will come. Brother, into high level, brother. Can we have a beautiful boys models, Kuna? So, anyone, when we will answer, anticipate the difficult airway anatomically. Piri Robin sequelae or Piri Robinson's. Yeah. Okay. Even obese child, sir, like adolescent obese child. Yeah. Good. Anyone? Any any other answers? Large tongue. Yeah, definitely large tongue. Short neck. So, anyone further? So there are two things. So one is unanticipated. So you don't know. So previously we decided to intubate. So first initially we could not bag. And then we did MR so far. Then we checked everything. Suction everything was fine. Proper sedation. Then we decided to intubate. But this is like anticipation. So any when you will anticipate. So difficult airway. When you are anticipated difficult airway. Difficult to with laryngoscopy. Look externally. Evaluation is done. With three three two score, I'll show you that Malampati score. As everyone pointed out, uh, obesity. You need to see the neck mobility. If you are unable to do the bag and wall mask, mask seal, obstruction, obesity, no teeth. If there is problem in placing the anticipated supraglottic devices, also restricted mouth opening can be there. There is can be tube obstruction. Sorry, if the airway obstruction, sometimes it can be distorted or disrupted airway also will cause this particular scenario. So you anticipate everything. Still, you are unable to do tricothyroid anatomy. Sometimes it can be hematoma, obesity, or it can be tumor also. So this is the Malampati scale. As you see, you can visualize this if you are anticipating a difficult airway. So this is grade one where you can uh, see the laryngeal view. So grade two, grade three, if you are grade four with the large tongue. So there is a difficult. So you can anticipate the difficulty and you can arrange for help. 
So this is a three three two rule where you can check initially before intubation when you are anticipating difficult airway. So three fingers from the cricoid through the mental mentum, and two fingers at the thyroid cricoid and thyroid. So three three two it can be done. So final thing is whenever you decide to intubate someone, you need to remember soap me. You need to see for suction. It needs to be placed in anchor suction. Then you need to have NRBM mask. There should be nasal cannula. Airway there should be two ETT expected size and one size below and one size above. And there should be if you have devices, you need to have less risky devices such as LM main. Or sometimes scalpel might be there because if you anticipate and you want to do cricothyroid anatomy, and you need to check the position. You need to do. Continuous monitoring need to be there. You need to make sure all the drugs are available, so, and other equipment such as bulgy need to be there. Two laryngoscope blades need to be there. If you have all these things, so whatever your problems are there during difficult airway, all can be prevented. The mnemonic is soap me. So take home messages: Do think of a physiological difficult airway while intubating a sick case. optimize hypoxia hypotension metabolic acidosis before intubation start inotropes early after initial optimization of fluids in case of metabolic acidosis give supraphysiological rate while bagging that is the most important thing to avoid further drop and worsening the condition so anticipate the anatomical difficulty when you have know, structural abnormalities in face and around neck and remember one thing All are not superheroes. Really, that is the thing which we have. Call for help when needed. So most of the time you can intubate. I totally agree. But you need to remember you have to call for help when you are facing a difficult scenario. Sometimes you can't bag and mask. Sometimes you can't. Uh, you might be forgetting. Okay, I'm doing everything. You might be forgotten about paralysis. So other person will tell and give that. So that will be helpful. So call for help when needed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, any questions? Uh, so, Mandi, one doubt, sir. Uh, in case of DK, also, and in the last slide, also, we have mentioned like that uh, supra physiological rate of like uh, bagging. So, that helps in metabolic acidosis. That concept alone, like uh, little doubtful, sir. Actually, if a DK agent, remember you decided to intubate, right? So your pH initially due to pH was six point nine. Your PCO two is eighteen. Okay, sir. So you decided to intubate this child because child's sensory is very poor. This is his five six whatever. So okay. At least breathing at initially forty forty five rate, right? When the child came to usually DK will be around six to seven years age. Okay, so sir. He is breathing at forty forty five. Usually when you intubate, you usually how much rate you will give thirty right maximum thirty thirty five. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, you don't you don't give more than that. So what will happen in this particular child if you give same thirty thirty five? So you are already you have this apnea stage where your PCO two will definitely go high if you can uh, if you don't intubate at least you take thirty seconds to intubate connect everything. So during that time your PCO two is already might have gone up right. Previously it was only eighteen, and the child is breathing at forty five. So during this period definitely your PCO two post paralytic it would have gone up to thirty five. Right. So, when you post intubation, you are giving the rate of thirty. Will the PCO two come down? Definitely not. So PCO two will be maintaining at thirty five. Previously, your PCO two eighteen with compensation, it is may your pH is maintained at six point nine. Post that, your PCO two has increased to thirty five. So what will happen to your pH? Definitely, it will further drop. So it can drop to six point eight, six point seven. It will further worsen the condition. So you need okay. to give the rate with the child is breathing before you intubate. Okay, so the child will not see what to rise and no further pH drop. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, to make it simple, just a small bit point. What is the target CO two you are uh, targeting there in the child? DK. Earlier, six point nine pH, and uh, your uh, CO two was sixteen or eighteen pre intubation. So during intubation, post intubation, what is the target CO two you are targeting? Because of raised recipe, you are targeting thirty five CO two. 
or you are targeting uh, what is the previous uh, CO2 pre intubation. If you answer this question, then you understand the concept. So, what is the normal CO2 target in LDC? Normally, it's like 35 to 45, but we might uh, uh, expect the previous one, sir, to maintain the pH. Exactly. So, the reason for cardiac arrest in this child is drop in pH due to your rise in CO2. Okay, sir. So your target is previous pH, CO2. Okay, sir. So you have to maintain there. So, child was maintaining it there by breathing at supra physiological rate. Child was not breathing at normal rate. Okay, sir. You have seen acidotic child who is breathing at a 45 to 50 rates. And okay, sir. Post intubation, if you try to give physiological rates, it will not maintain the CO2. Okay, sir. So that's why you have to match the rate what the child is breathing at. So, you need to count. That is the most important thing before intubating any IEM child or uh, DKA child. You need to count the respiratory rate what the child is breathing at. Okay, sir. How much amount of the chest rise he is getting? He is maybe maintaining his minute ventilation by increasing rate and increasing volume. So that's why when post ventilation also, you need to go for the same volume and same rate, not the normal rates, normal volumes. Even 6 ml per kg, 7 ml per kg will not be sufficient for that child. So not okay. only rate, match the volume as well. So you need to go for the high chest rise, normal, not normal chest rise. You need to go for a little bit high chest rise and with more rate. Okay, so what you are trying is you are matching the minute ventilation what child is trying to maintain before intubation. That's all. The simple answer is that thing. So you have to okay. match the minute ventilation. The minute ventilation contains the rate as well as volume. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Any other questions? To assess that uh, airway 3 3 rule, 3 3 2 rule, any minimum, way, sir? No, usually we do it from the age of one year because uh, less than one year you can't see for the neck and all because sometimes there will be short neck fat and all. Usually the age, age we see is from one year. Okay, so thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you Dr. Balakrishna. It was a very lucid presentation explained about the difficult uh, scenarios we will be commonly face uh, during intubation and I, have, I, got, I hope uh, you people uh, got something, uh, some points uh, where we do commonly mistakes during intubation because I have also faced the same situations. I have very well done with intubation and I put the tube correctly into the use of the, the, the trachea and bagging chest rise was there but chain was arrested. So many times we have faced this situation. So we need to modify our uh, intubation techniques. And we have to anticipate the difficult airways and uh, not only anatomical, physiological, we will often forget physiological difficult airways. So make sure that uh, next time when you are intubating, you are optimizing the child for intubation. Not only hemodynamics, everything. So you need to optimize the child's condition to favor the intubation, to, uh, to make the child go through the phase of intubation, hmm? the stress of intubation. So make, uh, make a habit that so to keep a checklist, so you have to make a checklist so that you have to keep ticking the check boxes. So what are the problems we'll anticipate in this child? So what are the things I have to make ready? So what is the optimization of this child? The plan for optimization. It could be hemodynamics, it could be hypoxia optimization, it could be metabolic acidosis optimization, or it could be difficult anticipated area optimization, anatomical area optimization. So you need to make a plan. So I can share the checklist in the group. So please go through the checklist. So it's very important. So we need to anticipate the problem and we have to prepare for it. So that only way you can uh, prevent this uh, unanticipated RS in a uh, process of intubation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul Krishnamansari. Thank you. So we'll conclude the meeting.